Welcome back to the third and last of the colloquium lecture series by Terence Tao from UCLA. Uh, today he will tell us about correlations of multiplicative functions. Please join me in welcoming Terry. Okay, so uh, this talk is again not related to the other two, uh, except well, first of all, again, there's one AI generated image. Um, and secondly, uh, it is sort of also, uh, I mean, you know, I work on many things in mathematics, but, but somehow the, the theme I'm always drawn to is, is the struggle between structure and randomness, the dichotomy between these two. You know, some, some parts of math are very structured, some are very random, and some are in between, and I often like the ones that are in between. Um, this is a topic also, it, it's, it's, it, um, um, my co-author, uh, Yoni Teravainen, also gave uh, uh, his prize lecture on, on this topic yesterday, and we've had a, sort of a very nice special session on related topics. Um, so some of this may be familiar, it will be a repetition of if you've attended these talks. Uh, so as I said, well, here's the AI generated image. Um, yeah, so analytic number theory, um, it's, it's a funny subject. You know, it's a little paradoxical in some ways. You know, on, on, on one hand, we sort of know the answer to every question in analytic number theory to high precision. So, so but we, we can prove very little of, of all these conjectures. So we can conjecture everything, and it, all the conjectures we know are correct, but we can't, we can't justify it. Uh, all but a tiny fraction of these conjectures. Um, and it's, it, in part, it's because, especially with the ones involving your primes. Um, and it's because the, the primes are this funny object that, you know, they're, they're both structured and random at the same time, you know, I mean, or pseudo-random, you want to be technical since the primes are not randomly generated. Um, but, you know, on the one hand, multiplicatively, they behave, have, they have a lot of, 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 of rigid multiplicative structure, but additively, they look very random, but we can't prove that uh, in many cases. Um, I did try to get GPT to, to illustrate this dichotomy with, a, with an artwork, this was its attempt. I'm not sure how successful it was in, in illustrating the, uh, uh, the, uh, the du duality of structure and randomness in number theory, but certainly better than anything I could do, so. Okay. Um, so, I mean, just to give you a basic example, you know, there are many, many questions in analytic number theory that are, you know, over a century old, and we just have no, uh, I mean, we've made progress, but we, have, we, are, we, we cannot close uh, a lot of our questions. Um, one of my, my favorite such is the twin prime conjecture, uh, which goes back at least to, to Polignac in like the 19th century. Um, and it's, you all know the conjecture, there's infinitely many twin primes. Um, so we know there's infinitely many primes, Euclid did that, um, but we know what infinitely many primes P such that P plus two is also prime. Or in other words, uh, the gap between consecutive primes should be two infinitely often. Um, and that's still open, many, many people have tried. Uh, quite a few people have uh, even tried to publish proofs, um, but uh, it's still open. Uh, we have a lot of progress. Uh, there's a famous uh, breakthrough of Yi Zhang uh, about 10 years ago now, um, and uh, uh, who found that there's at least infinitely many pairs of primes whose gap is at most, I think, 70 million was, was the initial bound, and it got narrowed down over uh, uh, um, a couple of years to, uh, and the, the current record is that we know that there's uh, infinitely many pairs of primes whose gap is somewhere between two and 246, um, but uh, that, that 246 has stayed stuck there for about nine years. Uh, um, and this is, this, this is just the simplest of um, a much uh, more general family conjectures. For example, this is a special case of something called the prime tuples conjecture of Hardy and Littlewood, which um, counts not just twin primes, but, but, but uh, tuples of primes, like P, P plus two, P plus six, for instance. But I won't talk about uh, this more general conjecture. Um, so, as I said, it's, um, these are questions, so the twin prime conjecture is true. We all know it, we just can't prove it. Um, and not only do we know there's infinitely many twin, twin primes, we know how many of them there are, up to some range x, and we have, we have like all the right answers, just, just none of the justifications. Um, so the, we have these extremely good random models of the primes, extremely reliable and accurate. Um, and so, um, you know, so the starting point is the fundamental theorem of analytic number theory, which is the prime number theorem. Uh, we know how many primes there are up to a large number x, uh, roughly. Um, it's, it's, it's the log integral of x, so the integral of dt over log t from t uh, two up to x, roughly x over log x. Uh, there's an error term, which is very interesting. Uh, the Riemann hypothesis is all about exactly what that error term is, but that's not important for this talk. Um, so we, we know how many primes there are in any large interval, um, uh, but we don't know how they're distributed. Um, and 
Uh, and the first naive guess is maybe they're distributed randomly, like you take a random set of, um, of, the, same, of the density predicted by the random theorem. And if you do that, uh, you are working what's called the Kramer random model of the primes, um, a probabilistic model of the primes, and you can use that to make predictions. Um, and if you do a naive uh, um, prediction using this, uh, this model, which I won't replicate here, you will predict that the number of twin primes up to x is roughly the, um, the integral of not of a dt of a log t, but dt of a log squared t, um, which is about x of a log squared x. Um, which would solve the twin prime conjecture because as x goes to infinity, that goes to infinity, and that would, that would imply infinity in twin primes. Um, but the primes are not completely random. Um, for example, uh, you know, a random set would, would distribute, the, the half its numbers would be odd and half its numbers would be even. Whereas primes, almost all the numbers are odd and only one of them is even. Um, so the primes are a very non-random uh, mod two and mod three and mod five and so forth. Uh, so you can modify the Kramer random model, uh, and that's what we call the Kramer Granville random model, where you also enforce uh, some co-formality conditions, uh, mod small primes, two, three, five, and so forth. Uh, and this creates uh, some adjustments to the prediction. Uh, so the Kramer random model prediction is, um, is almost certainly wrong, although we can't prove that either. Um, but uh, we have what we believe is to be the correct prediction, which is what the Kramer Granville random model does. And I'm not gonna define this model precisely, uh, but people have. Um, and it's the same prediction, the integral of uh, dt over log squared t uh, times a certain arithmetic factor called a singular series, uh, and it's a product, two times a product of odd primes of one minus one of p minus one squared. It's, it's a specific number, 1.32 something. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a corrected um, prediction for the number of twin primes. Um, and so this, this is almost certainly true, uh, this, but we can't prove this. Uh, we can, of course, we can do numerics, uh, you can count how many twin primes there are up to 10 to the 15, say, um, and count how, exactly how many there are, that's on the left column, and the, the prediction that I just wrote down, that's on the right column, and it's accurate to like, you know, at the bottom it's accurate to what, uh, five, six decimal places. Um, and similarly for any other kind of statistic of this type, we, we, we generally can find the right model that, that matches the numerics extremely well. Um, and what, is, what, what the accuracy of this model is kind of saying is that we have identified some obvious structure to the primes. Um, you know, that the primes avoid multiples of two, multiples of three, multiples of five, but we don't believe there's any other special structure to the primes. Um, that there is no tendency for twins in n plus two to be more likely to be simultaneously prime than, than, um, than not other than what is already coming from um, this, this local structure. Uh, that there's no secret, uh, property of the primes that we've missed, um, that we don't have to make any further adjustments to the, the kramer granville model. That, that is somehow, our, should be our final model. Um, but we, we, we can't do that. Um, you know, there's, there's always the chance that there's some, somehow some extra conspiracy in the primes, that they have agreed to, to do something, you know, um, you know, if two numbers n and n plus two, they have some secret pact. If n is prime, then n plus two decides not to be prime. Um, we, we don't know how to rule out these conspiracies. Uh, we can do something to them. You can use one conspiracy to rule out another. That's a, that's a fun game to play. But anyway, that's not, um, not the topic here. Um, so people have tried many, many ingenious ways to try to attack this conjecture, and we still can't do it. Um, and we now have sort of an understanding why, or there are, there are multiple reasons why we can't do it. Um, but there's one really fundamental one, and it sort of shows up, it's like this big, big wall or barrier all across, I think, number theory. And it's, it's, it's stopping, you know, we, we, can, we can, all our techniques, um, if you're lucky, you can get all the way up, up to this wall. Sometimes you get stuck beforehand, but it's hard to get, um, uh, but it, in, only in very rare cases have we been able to breach this, this barrier. It's called the parity barrier or parity problem. Um, and the twin prime, unfortunately, is on the other side of the wall. Um, and so are many other problems that have, uh, are famous and unsolved in, I think, number theory, Goldbach conjecture, for instance. Um, um, so, uh, what is the parity problem? Uh, so I need some notation. Uh, so I'll introduce what's called the Lubo function. Uh, so this is a, uh, a fairly simple function. It's just, uh, it's, it's defined on the natural numbers, lambda of n, and it's either plus or minus one. Uh, it just counts the parity of prime factors. So if you're the product of an even number of primes, it's one, and if you're the product of an odd number of primes, it's minus one. So it, it, it doesn't exactly count whether you're prime or not, it just that it counts whether you have an odd or even number of primes, it just, just counts the parity of primes. And, and if you have multiplicity, um, if a prime appears multiple times, you have to count it with multiplicity. 
So for example, lambda of four would be uh, plus one because four is two times two. You have an even number of primes in, in your factorization. Okay, so uh, just some simple examples. There, lambda two is minus one, lambda six is plus one. It's, it's, a, it's a simple function. Um, it's, uh, there's a more famous cousin of the Louisville function called the Mobius function, uh, which is almost the same function, except that the Mobius function uh, is supposed to vanish if you are not square free. Uh, but the Louisville function we define to, to still be, not, be plus or minus one, even if you have repeated prime factors. Um, but they're pretty much, or they're almost identical. Pretty much everything we know about the Mobius, we know about Louisville and vice versa. Um, Louisville is just a tiny bit more convenient for me to talk about today, so I'll, I'll try to focus on Louisville. Uh, for example, um, Lua function has a nice property. It's, it's, well, first of all, it's bounded. You know, it's always plus or minus one. It doesn't go to infinity. Um, but it's also what's called completely multiplicative. If you take lambda of n times m, um, it always factors into lambda of n times lambda of m. If you like, it's a homomorphism or a character. Um, Mobius uh, the function is almost, uh, it's, it's, it's just called multiplicative. Uh, it's th this, uh, the same identity only holds if n is about co-prime. Uh, so that's just slightly less convenient. Um, so that's one reason why I want to work with the Lua function. Okay, so it's a function that counts parity. Um, and if you just, you know, so, so here are the first, I think, 15 or so, uh, uh, you know, so lambda of one is one, lambda of two is minus one, lambda of three is minus one. And it just, if you look at the, at the if you stare at, at long strings of the Lua function, it just looks like a random string of, of plus or minus ones. And you know, you can actually subject um, the sequence to various statistical tests to try to see if you can distinguish it from a sequence of, of uh, random plus or minus ones. And it, 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 in many statistical tests, it just looks indistinguishable from random sequences. Of course, it's not random. There's only one Louisville sequence, and we just saw it's completely multiplicative. So when, when viewed multiplicatively, there's a huge amount of structure. This function is very structured multiplicatively, but additively, if you look at, say, consecutive elements or, 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 or a block of 10 consecutive elements, the Louisville function, it's very hard to distinguish this from a block of, of 10 random plus or minus ones. Um, and in fact, there's a general principle in number theory, and analytic number theory called, well, it's, uh, it's often called the, the Mobius pseudorandomness principle, but in this context, it would be the Louisville pseudorandomness principle, which basically tries to uh, say that this is what you'd expect. So uh, outside of sort of the, as long as you're not dealing with a purely multiplicative problem, um, the Louisville function should statistically look like random, um, a random sequence. Um, and this sort of is, supports all, uh, it can be used as, as heuristic justification for all kinds of both theorems and conjectures in analytic number theory. Um, for example, the prime number theorem that we mentioned previously, um, there's some very elementary uh, manipulations. It turns out that the prime number theorem is equivalent to the assertion that the um, Lua function has um, asymptotically mean zero. That if you take the sum of the first x um, values of the Lua function divided by x, that should go to zero, or if you like, about 50% of the time this, the Lua function will be plus one and 50% minus one. And of course, that's what random sequences do. That's the law of large numbers. Um, and so that, that's, I mean, uh, that's not the only thing that random sequences do, but that's one thing that random sequences do. And so the prime number theorem is in some sense justified by this um, um, pseudo randomness principle. Um, very similar argument shows that the Lua function should be equidistributed in any arithmetic regression. If you look at all the numbers that end in seven, mod 10, um, um, you, sh you know, half of them should have um, even parity, and half should odd parity. Lambda should be one half the time, and minus one half the time. We can prove that. Um, and, uh, and that's equivalent to what's called the prime number theorem in arithmetic progressions. Um, the Riemann hypothesis is also can be phrased in terms of the Lua function. Um, um, the Riemann hypothesis is actually equivalent to the assertion that if you take the sum of the first uh, x um, values of the Lua function, it should not only decay faster than x, it should actually decay like square root of x up to a log factor, which I won't talk about, which is very interesting, that's another story. Um, but that is, um, uh, yeah, which, and that, that's what random sequences do, okay? That, that, that's more like uh, to do the central limit theorem and, and the law of the double um, iterated logarithm. Um, but again, um, the probabilistic heuristics support the Riemann hypothesis and also uh, something called the generalized Riemann hypothesis, which is sort of the same thing in arithmetic progressions, roughly speaking. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, let's uh, make some more notation. So you can think of the Louisville function as, if you're a commentarialist, you can think of it as a two coloring of the, of the natural number. So let's uh, arbitrarily call uh, a natural number red if the Louisville function is plus one, so it's a product of even number of primes, and um, green if it is minus one. So you know, half the numbers are now red and half the numbers are green. And the, uh, the Louisville pseudorandomness principle suggests that somehow the red and green numbers are just statistically indistinguishable. That, uh, you take any statistical test for the red numbers and the green numbers, you can't tell them apart. Uh, and, and also correlations, you know, um, 
like if, um, um, so I, I won't precisely say what I mean by that. Um, okay, I'll just say that, that GRH, uh, for example, the general human hypothesis roughly says that every long atomic progression should contain about half, you know, should be half red and half green. Um, and pretty much any other interesting set, which isn't just the set of red numbers or, or set of green numbers, should contain 50% red, 50% green. Um, so, um, okay, so this is sort of a, a heuristic. Um, one consequence of this is that if you somehow decided to delete all the green numbers in the world and keep the red numbers, but make them twice as heavy, so you give, you give the red numbers a weight of two and the green numbers a weight of zero, um, that should statistically be indistinguishable from, uh, from as if you had both had the red and green numbers with a weight of one, or if the red numbers had weight zero and the green numbers had weight two. So there, there are different weights you can put on the natural numbers, um, and, um, uh, um, and like if you count how many of, the, of, of uh, how, what's the weight of an atomic progression, it should be the same, all three weights should be indistinguishable. So there are many, many statistical tests for which you cannot tell the difference between these, these measures. And many of our techniques in adding number theory, of kind of sieve theory or the circle method, just to name some examples, um, they can't colorblind. Um, they can't tell, if, if you secretly replace um, the uniform measure on the natural numbers with the one which you remove the red numbers and make the green ones twice as heavy or vice versa, um, they can't tell, like, like all the, um, the base inputs of sieve theory or the circle method, they, 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 it's just, this is a blip in the, in the error terms. Um, nothing, nothing really changes. Um, and so any result that you can prove using standard adding number theory techniques, uh, with a few exceptions. There are some key exceptions which are color sensitive, but uh, parity sensitive. But, uh, but many of our, of our techniques are, par are parity insensitive and they, they, they won't notice if you've, change the measure on your, your natural numbers in this way. And, and that's a problem for things like twin primes because uh, you know, if you want to count twin primes and you decide to reweight the, the natural numbers based on say the, the weight of the color of P plus two. So um, if you arbitrarily decide to, to, to make the red numbers P plus two twice as heavy, uh, the, the red numbers end with N plus two red twice as heavy and the red numbers end with N plus two green, um, you delete them. Um, a lot of our techniques in theory would not notice. And would, it would, um, a lot of techniques in circle method would not notice. Um, and so whatever predictions these methods can give or whatever rigorous results they can give for the standard weight, they can give for this other weight as well. Um, but if you do that kind of weighting, for example, if, if, you, if you delete all the, uh, the, the green numbers n where n plus two is red, uh, is green, um, and you only keep one plus two red, you have deleted all the twin primes because um, the Lubo function is minus one at the prime. So primes are, 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 um, are always green. So if you've deleted the numbers where n plus two is green, you have deleted um, um, yeah, twin primes in particular. Um, yeah, so this, this was a very vaguely stated argument, but, uh, but there's, there's a nice uh, formalization of this by Selberg, um, that, yeah, and, and Bombieri and a couple, yeah, we, there are ways to make this, this argument really quite, quite precise. Um, and so it, this blocks a lot of analytic number theory methods from proving things like um, the twin prime conjecture. Um, there are a few techniques, um, and they're very precious to us, okay, that, don't, that, that can somehow are parity sensitive. Um, so th the biggest one is multiplicative number theory. Right? I mean, um, you know, if you actually use the multiplicative property, you know, um, you know, like red times red equals red, and red times green equals, um, equals, uh, equals green and so forth, right? then, then, then you, you are actually, uh, um, being parity sensitive. Uh, so, you know, we can prove the prime number theorem, for example, you know, um, but um, using multiplicative number theory methods like using the Riemann zeta function, but we cannot prove the prime number theorem just from sieve theory. Well, okay, you can with a lot of extra effort, but that's another, that's another story. <laughs> okay, um, there's a lot of uh, extra stories that I really cannot talk about. Okay, but, um, all right. Okay, so the trinity conjecture is, is too hard. Um, but it has a cousin uh, which is easier. Uh, so one of the reasons is, so the parity barrier is one reason why it's hard. Um, another problem is that primes are sparse. Uh, they have asymptotically have density zero. Uh, and that creates a whole bunch of, of separate problems, which again, great story, I, don't want to talk, I can't talk about today. Um, but um, uh, you, you can work with a non-sparse version of the twin prime conjecture where you don't work with primes, but you work with red and green. Um, and that's called the, the Charla conjecture. Um, so rather than, uh, well, okay, so there's the general case, up there, let me start with the special case. So instead of looking at twins n, n plus two, which are both prime, 
you just look at n and n plus two and you look at whether they're red or green, okay? So we know that n is red half the time, green half the time. n plus two is red half the time, green half the time. But the expectation, and the numerics support this quite strongly, is that, is that they're uncorrelated. There's, there's no uh, relationship between the color of n and the color of n plus two, and the way you write that mathematically is that if you look at the correlation function, uh, you sum lambda of n times lambda of n plus two from n up to x, the trivial bound by the triangle inequality is x, but that should be um, decay faster than x. So asymptotically, on average, that should be zero. If you like, that's saying that one quarter of the time, n and n plus two are both red, one quarter, they're both green, one quarter, red, green, one quarter, green, red. They're like independent random variables. Um, and then there's, there's a k-term version where you don't just take n and n plus two, but you take k different shifts of n, and there's a very similar conjecture. Okay. Um, so this is considered, well, actually for a long time, this was considered the same difficulty as, as the uh, twin prime conjecture, but it was realized more recently that this is actually an easier, um, I mean, we, we can't solve, we still can't solve either, but we are closer to solving the Charlotte conjecture than we are to solving the twin prime conjecture. Um, I mean, the, par the parity barrier is still uh, mostly unbreached, but it's somehow the, 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 the big wall is thinner here than it is elsewhere. Um, Part of the reason is that, you know, as I said, the primes contain both structure and randomness, and that's annoying, that, that creates a lot of extra effort. Uh, uh, Luma function is kind of more like pure randomness. Uh, I mean, there is still some multiplicative structure, and it's, it is multiplicative, but um, additively, it really looks like random noise. Um, yeah, so it, uh, um, that's one reason why it's easier. The other is that it's, it's not sparse. Um, so our most powerful parity-sensitive method is multiplicative number theory. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't work, like people have certainly tried, you, you, you can try to set up you know, L functions or Dirichlet series and so forth, but you run into a problem really early on in, in the process, which is that, um, so lambda is a multiplicative function, but lambda of n plus two is not. Um, and um, so you know, this product of lambda of n plus two, there is no relationship between its value at n, its value at m, its value at n plus m. There's, there's no obvious multiplicative structure. The, the, the shift by two destroys all the multiplicativity. Um, so, I mean, you know, it's, it's still got factors that have multiplicative structures, so, you know, you, you, it, it's, but it's somehow buried, um, and it's, it's it, we, we can still access it, we've been able to access it sort of indirectly, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but, it, it's, but we cannot run the prime number theorem argument. Um, it is not equivalent to twin primes, and, and there's, there's no, um, it's not, they're not exactly um, related, uh, there is a focal implication, which no one has actually bothered to write down. Um, uh, uh, maybe someone should at some point. That, um, that if you can prove the Charlie conjecture, um, but you have to prove a more general version, which is technical. You have to first of all get better error terms in literal of x, and you also have to some more coefficients, and you need some uniformity in the coefficients, and there's a lot of technical caveats that, that that's one of the reasons why no one's ever written down. But if you can prove a sufficiently strong version of the Charlie conjecture, then um, that's, I mean, basically, once you break this wall somewhere, um, that all the other techniques, you know, it, it, it's like, um, and I'm thinking it's, it's like this big um, dam of water. Uh, that, this parity barrier is like this dam. There's this huge body of water, just all our analytic number techniques just waiting to be used to, to, um, to solve things beyond the barrier, but we, we don't have a breach. Okay, but once you have ch a child conjecture, that's a, that's a breach in the barrier. You, there's a ways to convert that to then attack other problems that were previously out of reach. Um, so yeah, if you can prove a sufficiently strong version of child's conjecture, then you should also be able to attack twin primes and things like that. Uh, but we can't do that. In fact, uh, technically, uh, as stated, the only case that we know is k equals one, um, of one function, which is the prime number theorem. Um, but two and higher are sort of the easiest uh, unsolved uh, cases. Um, and we've been able to make some progress. Yeah, so, so there's this technical thing. Um, so traditionally, in number theory, we, we, we take these what are called natural averages. We, we, we average, we sum up to x and divide by x. Um, and that's sort of classically what we've done. Um, it turns out that there are but it's, it's, this is a rough cutoff at, at x, um, and, um, and it creates a, 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 some technical issues. Uh, so there are gentler ways to sum. Uh, I mean, you, you may know of Chisao summation or, of, of summing series that are divergent. Um, and there's something kind of similar in number theory. Uh, it's called logarithmic averaging. So instead of summing uh, whatever you want, like for example, lambda n plus h1 up to lambda n plus h2, unweighted, you weight by the harmonic weight, one over n, and you divide, uh, you sum up to x, and you divide by one over log x. Um, and this is a better weight. It's closer to being multiplicatively invariant. You know, so, so natural um, summation has got nice transition invariant properties. You know, I mean, um, uniform measure is, is a transition invariant measure. But you know, um, as you know, on say the, the, the positive reals, uh, dt over t is a, is a multiplicative invariant measure. 
Um, this is discrete. Uh, it's kind of like a discrete multiplicative almost high measure, d, d, uh, weighting by the integers by one over n. It's not exactly a high measure, but it, it, it tries to be. Um, and uh, and be, because there's still some multiplicative structure uh, residual in, in this problem, uh, it, is, it is convenient to do this averaging. Um, so this is average version of the conjecture, which is weaker. Um, there's an easy submission of bi-parts argument that if you can prove the original Chalice conjecture you, with no weights, you can prove it with this uh, uh, logarithmic weighting. Um, it's kind of like if a sequence converges, then it's a uh, uh, series converges, then it, it also Chisawa converges. It's a very similar type of argument. Um, but not conversely, uh, this is strictly an easier problem. Um, right, so just to illustrate this, um, so as I said, if you want to, to control the natural averages of the Luba function, that's as hard as the polynomial theorem, and there's still no really short proof of the polynomial theorem. But if you want to control just the uh, logarithmic averages of the um, um, Luba function and get some cancellation, uh, that you can move in half a page. Um, it, it comes from a very simple identity that if you sum the, the uh, um, if you take a number n and you sum all the Luba function of all the divisors of n, that turns out to be one when d is a square and zero otherwise. That's a, that's a nice identity. And if you sum that for d up to x, you very quickly get this, this, this identity, uh, this estimate. Um, and this log average thing, we can actually prove some cases. Uh, so a few years ago, I was able to prove the log average version of the Charlie conjecture with k equals two. Um, and then with Yoni Tervainen, we were able to also get the odd case, um, which unfortunately, I mean, that sounds like we got half the cases, but actually the cases that are all inter use, the most useful are the even cases uh, for some positivity that, that is really helpful. But we could get uh, the odd cases at least. Um, and then recently, the, 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 the quantitative version, uh, the bounds on the k equals have become extremely strong, uh, surprisingly so, actually. Um, and we can handle not just the multiplicative uh, Luba function, but many other functions like this. Um, so um, one of the first applications of all this theory was that uh, I was able to solve this, this old conjecture of Erdős, uh, which is this fun conjecture about discrepancy in discrepancy theory. So discrepancy theory is so ask, asking how, um, how well balanced can you make a sequence of plus or minus ones um, you know, um, you know, the, um, you know, there are um, Ramsey theorems that say that if, you, if you, no matter how you try to um, um, distribute uh, the you know, plus minus ones evenly among the natural numbers, there must be some arithmetic progressions where it's all ones or somewhere it's minus ones. So the theorem of Van der Waarden. Um, but Erdős asks: Suppose you you look at just what are called homogeneous arithmetic progressions, um, d, two d, three d, up to a d. Um, progressions where the, uh, the spacing is the same as, as the initial starting point, and you just want to make your function balanced on, um, on, 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 on these um, homogeneous progressions, is it possible to find a function plus minus ones that is that, uh, where this, these discrepancies are all bounded? Um, so you know, is this, is this uh, um, if the soup over all the sum is finite or infinite? Um, so I proved it wasn't possible that it was, uh, that in fact this, that no matter what you did, the, 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 the uh, um, uh, this discrepancy um, had to be, had to be um, larger than any finite number that was infinite. Um, uh, for comparison, the previous best known record result was just one year previously that we, knew, we know the discrepancy was at least three. Um, that if, if you color the natural numbers, there was some homogeneous progression where there were three times more plus ones than minus ones or vice versa. And that was not an easy result. Uh, that used um, uh, one of the massive SAT solvers that I mentioned in my first talk. And uh, at the time, the proof was the longest proof, uh, the largest proof ever created, uh, 13 gigabytes, which is, but that's, that's now like a, a, a 10,000th of the largest, I think there's a petabyte proof um, out there. But at the time in 2014, it was, uh, it was briefly the held the record of, of the largest proof. Um, not going to uh, uh, say too much about the, uh, how you reduce how you derive the discrepancy problem from the Charlotte conjecture. Um, well, I'll just say in very, very high level. Um, so this, the Erdős discrepancy problem concerns an arbitrary um, sequence plus minus ones with no multiplicative structure. But you can, you can do some multiplicative Fourier analysis and there's a reduction that roughly speaking, you only need to understand what happens for multiplicative sequences. And if you can do that, you can derive what happens for arbitrary uh, sequences uh, with uh, a little bit of Fourier analysis magic. Um, and then, uh, and the, the advantage of doing that is that these, the, these sums of homogeneous progressions just collapse to partial sums. Um, and then, so you just need to show that the partial sums of certain multiplicative functions are unbounded with some asterisks I don't, don't wanna talk about. Um, and there's a standard, uh, so this is a, a global sum, a long sum, but there's a, there's a standard trick to control global sums by short sums. Uh, it's called the van der Koppen inequality. 
And basically, if you want to show that, that a long sum gets bigger and bigger, you just need to show that adjacent numbers are not correlated very much. So you can reduce things to understanding the correlation between adjacent uh, or nearly adjacent values of this function f. And that's basically the Charlie conjecture. Uh, and so you can use progress on the Charlie conjecture to, to solve this problem. Uh, again, there's an asterisk. There's some functions for which the Charlie conjecture doesn't apply. Um, one of the functions are called pretentious. And that's another great story. I can't talk about it. All right. Um, so this Charlie conjecture has ended up being connected to all kinds of areas of mathematics. Um, so I won't talk about it so much, but uh, it is also connected to uh, a conjecture in uh, relating, um, or in some sense not relating, uh, the Louvre function to dynamical systems. Um, so one way to formalize the fact that the Louvre function is, is somehow random is that it should not be, there should be no way to even approximately predict it using some kind of um, predictable sequence. Okay, so, so there's this notion in, in the Goddard theory of something called a, a deterministic sequence. Um, it, it's a sequence which is generated by, um, uh, you have some dynamical system, some compact space with, an, with a shift, and you, you take an orbit, and you, you, you divide your, your orbit into, into two sets, and you put a plus one if you're in, in, uh, in one set, if the orbit's in one set, and minus one in another, and you get a sequence of plus minus ones. Now, every sequence of plus minus ones can be generated by, uh, in this manner, from, from some dynamical system. But if you uh, restrict to a very rigid type of dynamical system, what I call the zero entropy um, system, which I want to define here, then um, this, the, uh, the sequences you get are very rigid. You get things like periodic sequences or almost periodic sequences, um, or uh, for example, uh, e to the two pi i times a polynomial um, of, of n is a very typical deterministic sequence. Um, and the, uh, there's a conjecture of Sinak, uh, which roughly speaking uh, says that, that uh, the Louvre function is uh, and uncorrelated with any deterministic sequence. So the, the basically, no, um, yeah, uh, uh, if there's a sequence which doesn't generate much entropy, which much randomness, then it has nothing to do with, with um, um, asymptotically, with the Lua function. Um, and that turns out to actually be equivalent, it, it's, it's a different way of expressing randomness, but it turns out that it's equivalent to this Charla conjecture, at least with this log averaging, averaging asterisk. Um, but maybe I will uh, uh, not, uh, uh, talk about it more. Yeah, so uh, we would like to settle the Charlie conjecture for many reasons. It would settle this, this, this um, um, uh, Sinai conjecture as well. Uh, we would start being able to, to attack many other questions about um, multiplicative functions. Uh, and already there was, the progress we already have has, has settled some old conjectures already. Well, we saw one, but there were several others. Um, and, you know, maybe, as you said, you know, um, as I said, you know, in, in the future, maybe we can start attacking twin primes and all the other things on the other side of the par parity barrier. And we are sort of getting close. It's, it's like this barrier has got like several um, layers to it. And like we've managed to break through some of them, but there's this was one, one last barrier which, which is still completely has no crack in it. Um, but we like somehow exactly one breakthrough away from really having a, a great theory, um, as opposed to five breakthroughs. Um, so um, we do have a strategy to attack this conjecture now um, in general. And it's based on, uh, so we are largely exploiting um, the multiplicative structure as I said, of, of the Lua function, and especially at small primes. Okay, so the Lua function is multiplicative. So one consequence of this is if you multiply n by a prime, it flips the color. Uh, so if you multiply a, a red number by, by p, it becomes green and vice versa. So lambda of p n is always negative of, uh, that p should not be there, it should be negative lambda of n, not p times lambda of n. Um, and so, um, Every time you, you want to correlate, say, n and n plus one or n, n plus two, you could try to dilate by p uh, using this multiplicativity. And, and now, you, instead of looking at the correlation of two um, uh, nearby numbers, you can look at the correlation of two almost nearby numbers. Um, now, that seems a bit worse, so even further away now. Uh, but then you, you can try to play games like you try to average in, in, in the prime. Um, and that, uh, you know, the more averaging you have, the better chance you, you have of getting some cancellation. Um, and so you want to control, you relate these, these short, these, these very local averages to slightly um, longer range averages. And so we, we're able to do this to some extent. Like if there are, there are certain short interval averages that we can relate effectively to uh, say the two-point correlation um, of the Charlie function or k-point correlations. So we can kind of inflate the, um, our scale of averaging a little bit. Um, on the other hand, if, you've already, if, if you already can, if you already got to the point where you're studying averages on a somewhat long interval, then you can use the multiplicative again, and there are ways to inflate the, uh, relate the correlation on a 
long interval to ones with on, on even longer intervals. Um, again, using, using multiplicativity. Um, and a bunch of techniques from analysis and combinatorics, graph theory shows up a lot. Um, and so you can try to inflate things. And once you're on really long averages, uh, uh, at, when you're averaging a function on really long averages, finally multiplicative number theory becomes very useful. Um, and you know, the prime number theorem kicks in. You know, if you have the Riemann hypothesis, it becomes even more useful. But even without the Riemann hypothesis, you can get um, lots and lots of good bounds on long averages. And so this is hierarchy of, of scales. And if we can just sort of get a complete chain from you know, scale one, which is what we need to control Chala, to the larger scale, which is where multiplicative number theory uh, works, then, then we, can, we can actually do all this. Um, uh, so the, the and we have like 90% of this chain complete. <laughs> but this is a gap. Um, so as I said, you know, if you want to, for example, control the average of lambda of n lambda plus one, uh, you can inflate it by p. Um, and uh, you basically end up uh, staring at the correlations of lambda of n, n plus p. Uh, but this is one price you pay is that you have to restrict numbers n that are divisible by p, otherwise there is no relationship here. Um, you see, again, the, the weight one over n is not actually a hard measure. It, uh, this is because of the discreteness. Um, so this is divisible by n, which is annoying, uh, but we have ways of dealing with, we, can, we have ways of removing this divisibility constraint. Um, so um, I introduced a technique based on uh, information theory, Shannon entropy, um, and then later uh, Hethcourt and Radzivy uh, introduced a technique based on uh, expander graphs. Um, and so, uh, but uh, in some, as long as you don't averaging, as long as you, as long as you keep the prime streets um, small, and you work with small intervals, you can replace uh, this, you can remove this divisibility on p relation, and then you, you have uh, an um, expression that is, that is actually much more tractable, and then you average in p, and you basically are reduced to understanding short averages of this Luber function, and that turns out to be a problem that was solved. There was a breakthrough um, in, um, well, at least for two-point correlations, there was a, there was a, there was a breakthrough in um, multi multiplicative number theory that by um, Matamaki and Radziwi that managed to, to somehow push the, the uh, um, multiplicative number theory methods all the way down to almost scale one already, um, and then just by adding this, this extra little, um, 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 input, you can, uh, you can get all the way down. And in, in the case of two-point correlations, it all works. And you can get, um, and we, we have this two-point chala. Um, for higher k, uh, you can do some of this analysis. Uh, you, can, you, can, you, uh, you have to start inputting higher order free analysis, which is another great story, which I cannot talk about. Um, but it, it ends up, you, you, um, you have to study averages not of uh, the Lua function directly, but Lua function twisted by various phases, uh, like twisted by a, a linear phase in the simplest case, k equals three, and then it gets a lot worse for higher k. Um, and unfortunately, that breaks the multiplicativity, and, and now the Radzi theory does not um, uh, extend to meet uh, uh, these averages. Um, but you, you, we are able to relate Chowler to sort of small scales, like short averages of scales less than log x, roughly, uh, we, we, can, we can, uh, can do. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, I, um, I think I will skip the uh, uh, this slide. Um, let's see, how much time do I have actually? Uh, right, okay, so um, we have a separate argument, so we have actually multiple separate arguments, but, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of very exciting progress um, by Walsh, who introduced a, a bunch of really elegant arguments which can relate reasonably short averages to long averages. Um, so th there's, one there's one argument of his in particular called the contagion argument. So um, uh, if you want to show that uh, on, on many, many short intervals, the Lua function it behaves randomly. Um, so you assume that it doesn't. Okay, so you assume that for many, many short intervals, the Lua function is doing something non-random. For example, it, it's, it's oscillating at some frequency here, and over here it's oscillating at some other frequency and so forth. So there, there's, there's lots of intervals that are somewhat infected with um, some Fourier frequency. Um, now, it turns out that because um, the function is also multiplicative, um, if you take an interval and you dilate it by a prime, if you're already oscillating with some frequency down here, the dilation will probably also be oscillating with some related frequency up here. And then if you, if you undilate it somewhere with a different prime, it means that, that, that different uh, intervals, um, probably the frequency that one interval oscillates at and the frequency that another interval that oscillates at, they're related. Um, and using a bit of graph theory, um, and um, you need the fact that the operation of multiplication by primes and division by primes kind of has some sort of, creates some sort of expander graph. 
Um, and you can show that once you have lots of little local correlations um, in your Lua function, you can kind of glue them together and they, they infect the bigger intervals. And these slightly bigger intervals also must also start os um, exhibiting some oscillation at, at certain frequencies. Um, and you can keep chaining this in a big pyramid and you, and you can eventually get a very big interval where there's a very big oscillation um, which you can rule out by multiplicative number theory. So there is a, a, a strategy, there are ways to make this all rigorous. I think I will skip the actual details. Um, and um, yeah, all this theory works beautifully um, in two points. Uh, for two points, there's no Fourier frequency at all. Like you just send an average on, on um, uh, you basically have to average the plane Lua function, uh, either by, weighted by one or by a Dirichlet character. And it, it's, it's, all, it's all very straightforward. And so um, for two points, we, we're, we're getting, I mean, the, the theory has become extremely satisfactory. Um, so uh, for example, if you want to control log averages of, of lambda and, and f plus one, which is the kind of thing you need to solve the discrepancy problem. Uh, the trivial bound is log x, if you just take absolute values. Um, you know, I was, I was first able to get little o of log x, I could get a, a tiny decay. I eventually went back and actually saw, tried to figure out exactly how much decay I got in, in that argument, and I got a very tiny amount of decay. I gained basically four logs um, of, of x. There's a standard joke that analytic number theorists, what does the drowning analytic number theorists say? This is log, 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 log. We have a lot of logs in, in this business. Um, but you know, over time, the arguments got refined. So uh, with Yoni, uh, we managed to, to optimize the entropy argument and get down to three logs. Uh, but then Hofgott and Radzui used um, some very nice analysis of random walks on expander graphs, which gave a um, significantly stronger result of log, log x. And, and just very recently, uh, there's a result of Cedric Pilat, which actually even gets uh, the, the gain down to, to basically one log, uh, which is really quite amazing. Um, you know, the next step would be to get a power up saving, uh, which is actually what's conjectured, but that's about, a, that's at least as hard as Riemann hypothesis. Um, so this, this, this is pretty much the best you could hope to get uh, with all our technology. So we, we understand two-point correlations extremely well now. Um, in the odd case, there's a parity trick. Um, you may know sometimes when you integrate by parts, like a, a trig function and exponential function, sometimes you can't quite evaluate the integral, but you can sometimes, sometimes show that it's equal to the negative of itself by like two integration by parts, and then, then you can say that it's zero. Um, so there's a similar trick uh, that somehow lets you cheat uh, and deal with the odd case, um, somehow by dodging the, the actual difficulty. Um, but it only works for Louisville, and it only works for this odd, uh, in this odd case. Um, and it's, it's a pain because the even case is the most interesting. The even case implies the odd case, but odd case does not imply even case. Um, um, yeah, but we have this strategy, we, we can inflate short um, 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 uh, childhood type correlations at the micro scale to these sort of um, meso scale correlations at, uh, at, 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 like, at like log x with small power. Um, and Walsh has, Walsh has been refining his arguments quite a bit and he's, in his most recent paper, uh, he, was, he showed that, assuming the Riemann hypothesis, which at this point we're willing to do, uh, he can control averages even at scale log x to a large power, log, log, log x to a, is actually, he, he can run his arguments and, and, and control those averages by extremely lo um, large averages, which we know how to control. And so we can get from the larger scale down to log a to a big power, and we can get from log a to a small power down to child up. And this is one tiny little gap remaining, how to jump between log x to a small power and log x to a big power, uh, and that is, uh, one thing where all our techniques break down for different reasons, um, but um, it, it, it log x, I mean, it appears to be the fundamental barrier here. Um, uh, one reason is, is that the, the number of, uh, the product of all the primes up to log x is less than x, but, the, but uh, the, yeah, it, 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 it is a natural barrier for trying to use prime, when you're trying to combine many, many primes together. Um, but uh, the most recent paper of Walsh, he has, has some intriguing hints that maybe his method can actually get past this barrier. He hasn't actually quite done yet, I'm sure he's had at work. Um, but yeah, this, this uh, yeah, so basically uh, stay tuned, I think there'll be more progress in, in this area in the next few years. Um, I think I will stop here, thank you very much. for a beautiful talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. There are two mics on the left side. Yeah. Hi, uh, wonderful talk, thank you very much. I just wanted to check on one detail at the very beginning of your talk. You mm -hmm. mentioned that this uh, 
a certain asymptotic for the lambda function was equivalent to uh, GRH. Did you yes. mean GRH for uh, cyclotomic fields or the oh, entire no, GRH? Uh, no, don't, um, just the GRH for Dirichlet uh, uh, L functions. Okay, um, good. Yeah, I, you could probably write down an equivalent form for more general uh, L functions. I haven't thought about exactly what it would be. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, uh, thanks for the talk. And uh, I just had a kind of a naive question. Uh, you talked about, I guess, uh, methods that were uh, parity sensitive, I guess, mm -hmm. just in analytic number theory. So there's like this fabled uh, parity problem. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about the centrality of uh, methods from multiplicative number theory and kind mm -hmm. of like bridging mm -hmm. this uh, parity problem. So I wanted mm -hmm. to know, uh, were there, could you give an example of like a parity sensitive method that is somehow not from analytic or m multiplicative number theory? Okay, um, so there's a, f a small number. Um, so um, methods from Ramsey theory are, are parity in sense. So uh, for example, there's this famous scheme of Zamoretti that um, dense subsets of, of, uh, of integers contain lots and lots of atomic progressions. Um, and even if you delete half the integers, um, as long as somehow it's, it's still dense in the other half, uh, you will still get lots and lots of, of atomic progressions. Um, so it turns out that using tools like Zamoretti's theorem is somehow parity um, insensitive in some sense. You lose a factor of two or something, but you still get a lot of, um, a lot of progressions. And um, many, many years ago, I proved to Ben Green that the primes contain arithmetic, many um, infinitely long, um, arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Um, and that was a problem subject to the parity barrier. But because we used Zermody's theorem, uh, we could get around that barrier. Um, later on, we found an, another way to prove it using um, many things, but including multiplicative number theory, and so we found a, a, a different route. Um, yeah, there are what are called bilinear methods. Um, yeah, so, so these, this parity barrier kind of blocks you from uh, any technique that's based on sort of linear sums where you use something over one n and, and lambda of n times something. Um, if you can somehow control bilinear sums where you have uh, two variables n and m and you're summing some lambda of some function, some polynomial of n and m um, times some, some weight, um, once you have two variables, uh, you, you can use, um, your weights might be able to distinguish red and green of the pair. Uh, and so in the few cases where we can prove some bilinear estimates, um, uh, you can actually beat the parity barrier. So there was a celebrated result of Friedland and Ivanich that, um, you know, so there's, there's this famous conjecture of Legendre that, that there are infinitely many, many primes of form n squared plus one. And we can't prove that because of the parity barrier. But um, Friedland and Ivanich show there's infinitely many primes of form n squared plus n plus four, um, which is a larger set, still very sparse. Um, but there's, this, there's certain bilinear sums involving n squared and n plus four that, that through the magic of algebraic number theory, they were able to get some handle on. Um, it's a great result. Yeah, so there's a, a small number of, of times when we've you know, breached the parity barrier, but, very, but they're, they're, they're still very rare. Thank you. What is the largest pair of twin primes known so far? Oh, um, I have to look it up. Uh, 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 so yeah, there are people who sort of uh, devote their computers to, to searching for these things. Um, I, I mean, maybe some in the audience may, may know offhand. Uh, um, I think there are, I, I mean, you could just sort of brute force search, but that's, that's not the, the best way to find these large twin primes. I mean, numbers that are kind of like Mersenne primes, you know, so not exactly Mersenne primes, but like, like powers of small numbers, plus or minus one times a constant. Um, those are fairly easy to check for being prime. And so I think the largest twin primes are kind of Mersenne type, but I, I don't know roughly the, Number. Um, uh, sure, okay. The, the, the number of zeros is uh, one to 12 million. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, there are, there are some very large ones. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll find the answer and I'll talk about it. Okay. Thanks. Hey. So when switching from the, from the Mobius function to the Louisville function, you lose a bit of the randomness because the, mm. like, like, like the, the pole at one half causes phenomena like the mm. summatory function appearing to be mm. negative for the first billion terms or so. Mm. Is this something that comes up in practice um, with these results? Eventually it would, um, but um, uh, if our error terms ever get below one of our root x, uh, we would start noticing it. But, uh, you, you would need many things, including the Riemann hypothesis, to even get that far. Um, you know, so I gave these, this table of tiny improvements where we're shaving log logs and logs and so forth. Um, yeah, so, I, so that's coming from contributions from, from square numbers. And square numbers are really, really sparse 
compared to prime numbers and all these other things. That, um, I mean, while it, it does make a, a small contribution, in the grand scheme of things, it, it, makes, it makes very little difference, uh, at least um, for this part of number theory. You know, the, there are other things like for Siegel zeros and so forth where it, they, they, these are important, but uh, yeah, not, not for, for this area yet. Oh, it's a very nice talk. So now it seems that many of the results uh, depends on the conditions that the function, like the Lua function, need to be multiplicative. Mm -hmm. So uh, have you think about it if we can release this condition to some not complicated, but maybe some weaker version of the... Uh, that, is, that is a great question, actually. Um, it's been proposed a couple of times whether how much of this theory extends to sort of weakly multiplicative functions of some sort. Um, and th there are, there are um, some applications for this sort of thing. Like, like people consider things like smooth numbers or rough numbers, uh, um, numbers that, that have all prime factors less than a certain uh, threshold or something. And th these are sets um, whose indicator function is kind of has approximate multiplicativity properties, but not completely multiplicative. Um, so yeah, there, there are some extensions of this theory, but I, I, um, there's, not, there's not really a canonical standard definition of what an almost multiplicative function is. Um, maybe there should be. Maybe we should actually develop this theory. That's a good question. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I know that uh, in some places in mathematics, Sometimes the trick is to not study an object directly, but to study a dual object, right? The first thing that comes to mind is per, uh, perhaps the theory of functional analysis. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is there a good um, object already present, or can we come up with one, a good functional? Well, in multiplicative number theory, there is. It's called the Riemann zeta function. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, well, we can take the Fourier dual of, of the primes, and that is basically uh, the log derivative of the zeta function. Uh, um, yeah, so if you have a purely multiplicative problem, um, then we kind of have a good theory. Um, and, uh, there's a function, and also, if you also want to care about uh, uh, progressions, you also in introduce characters. Um, yeah, additively, um, well, there's additive Fourier analysis, which, which we use a lot. Um, yeah, we don't have the sort of linearity um, that you kind of need to get a really good duality. Uh, there's not a category of a home. And, it is definitely not abelian. Uh, I, um, um, but in some sense, um, I mean, well, we we, um, uh, we do study moments a lot of of of, of these multiplicative functions, and, and studying the moments is again some kind of, some kind of dual to the, the distribution itself. And there are lots of theorems relating the the you know, if the moments grow at a certain rate, then 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 your distribution must do this and so forth. Um, yeah, so th there are uh, um, various dual things you can do, and that they're somewhat useful. Um, but what's, what's, we don't have a, sort of a duality theory that, that sort of transforms the problem into, a, a, that lands you into a field where there's, there's a suddenly a huge bunch of new tools that you can use. Um, maybe there's one or two, and then you, and you can go back and forth. But uh, um, it's, it's certainly a move you can do, but it's not, it's not a magic wand that solves the problem. Yeah. A follow-up question. Um, if, I ha if I have two integer sequences, yeah. That um, that I can apply multiplicative, multiplicative functions on, mm -hmm. and they agree after I've done this. Um, can that um, be a technique or? Um, well, so this uh, okay. I, I, I didn't briefly mention this thing called pretentious number theory. Um, there there is somehow this. Uh, there's a way to to um, uh, create a distance between two different functions, uh, um, particularly multiplicative functions, uh, as a, by comparing what they do on primes in particular. Um, okay. And yeah. Um, and if one sequence is another sequence is twisted by a Dirichlet character, then, then they are related in, in various useful ways. Um, yeah, so, so there is some sort of geometry and in the space of all sequences um, um, that, uh, that is very useful, and at least certainly conceptually. Um, yeah, so we, 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 uh, if two sequences are close in, in this metric, we see that one of them pretends to be the other, and it's a very useful conceptual notion, um, invented actually partly by my, my, my host here. But, um, um, yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, it, it's certainly um, it helps a lot to not just consider each sequence isolation, but how it relates to, to, to a, a lot of, of sister sequences. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a bit more about 
the shortcomings of the sort of um, additive combinatorial like density theorems um, methods for tackling the specific problem? Um, well, um, so for example, Zermody's theorem is the great theorem if you want to count progressions. Okay, it, it says that, uh, that arithmetic progressions have a special property. They're somewhat indestructible, or almost indestructible. Like if you have a set and you want to get rid of all the arithmetic progressions in the set, you need to basically d delete almost the entire set. You have to make a set of zero density. Um, that's the only way you can get rid of all the progressions. Um, in contrast, if you have a set and you want to get rid of all, all the, um, the twins, uh, you can do it fairly easily. Um, uh, you can basically just identify all the twins and delete them. Actually, it's just the simplest thing to do. Um, it, but it's also, it's also very dense sets like, um, um, like the mobs of three, uh, which have no twins. Uh, they have density one third. Um, so there are the you know, standard arithmetic combinatorial things don't, don't apply. Um, there's a more technical reason. Um, uh, um, one thing that additive combinatorics has taught us is that different patterns come with a number called complexity. Um, and so there's these complexity zero patterns that are very easy to count, complexity one patterns which the circle method can handle, complexity two patterns, we need what's called quadratic Fourier analysis and so on and so forth. Um, and um, arithmetic progressions have this finite complexity that can be handled by these additive combinatorial techniques. Twin primes, unfortunately, twins have infinite complexity um, and none of our current technology can handle it. Um, there are just too many ways in which you can get rid of the twins uh, for this type of strategy to, to, to be useful. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I, at the beginning of your talk, you were mentioning how the twin prime conjecture is kind of this uh, somehow nebulous but not nebulous thing that we like understand should be true, but a lot of the mm -hmm. techniques that we have aren't quite mm -hmm. good enough and sensitive enough to understand mm -hmm. it. Um, to me, this was a bit reminiscent of results in other fields um, that also have other, I guess, big conjectures that we believe to be true, but can't quite prove. For example, like P equals MP, P not equals to MP, mm -hmm. where we have things like the relativization barrier of like mm -hmm. how diagonalization could never work as a proof technique because we need proof techniques that are sensitive to oracles. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I was curious if you had any sort of perspective that like unified a bunch of these kind of big, like unprovable it seems, technique um, results yeah. at least by our current um, models. You know, our theory of barriers is nowhere near as advanced in number theory as it is in complexity theory, where, where there, there, you have this, this very precise notion of oracles, for example. Um, you know, so, uh, okay, I'll give you an example of a barrier which we've not been able to formalize. Um, so, um, uh, there are these hypothetical objects called Siegel zeros. Uh, so these are zeros of, not the zeta function, but the cousin or the Dirichlet L function that are very, very close to, to one. Um, and they shouldn't exist. The, the generalized human hypothesis is they, they don't exist. Um, and it's been, but it's incredibly, people have tried for 50, 60 years to get rid of them. Um, and they seem to be very stubbornly, they seem to want to exist. Um, that that um, it's almost as if there's an alternate universe out there, which isn't our, our current universe, where sequel zeros do exist, but they are, but this alternate universe is almost indist indistinguishable from our regular universe in, in every respect, except for the presence of this exceptional sequel zero. Um, but we've not been able to formalize uh, this, this this other alternate universe. Um, so, so here, you know, there's a specific measure that's sober constructed that you could kind of formalize the parity problem. Um, so there's, there's a certain barrier that's, you know, some, um, there is a sober zero barrier, which is actually related to the parity barrier that also like it's, it, it blocks a lot of sieve theory techniques from working as well and a lot of other techniques um, that uh, should not be able to detect sequel zeros. Uh, but we don't actually have a concrete barrier that, that really lets us say for certain that certain methods can't do things like detect Siegel zeros. Uh, it's, it's more uh, an intuition at, at this current point. But I, I think there should be more, more research into, into barriers in, in additive number theory. Thank you. Well, let's thank Terry for a wonderful set of lectures.